Hello and welcome to Talking Books. I'm Jill de Villiers. We're doing something different today and we're going to speak about more than just a single book. My guest is Hamilton Wendy, an author, a freelance writer and a television producer. He has covered a number of revolutions and wars across the African continent and he has written several books including novels, non-fiction and children's books. Welcome Hamilton and thank you very much for, Thanks, for joining nice us. To be here. Um, let's start with your work as a war correspondent. You've been on 15, involved in 15, covering 15 wars across the continent. Yeah, I mean, also in Iraq, Afghanistan, the Palestinian areas. Uh, so, you know, I started off working as a journalist in the 80s when basically there was almost, you can almost call it an intifada, if you like. There wasn't a day of peace from March 1985 until our elections in 1994. So I worked a lot. Uh, a lot initially as a runner and sound man for the BBC, so I was very fortunate to get in at that level and uh, <coughs> covering a lot of the unrest that was happening in our country at the time. I also left the country for a while. I lived in New York City. I taught English in Japan, which is sort of where my love for writing children's books started because I had a lot of time to read and I reread The Wind in the Willows and I reread Alice in Wonderland and partly I think in a way to help some of my students because although they they not they're quite metaphorical stories. The language is quite simple, but the stories are very good. So it's very uh, good for yes, teaching. Yes. So when you when you teach language to adults, um, very often children's books are used in for that to to make it easier. They for are, and of course, all good children's books, including mine, I hope, are also <laughs> written with adults in mind. So you're not talking down to people. You, it's a very good story, and so that really rekindled my love for children's books. I, I've I've always read them, but. As an exciting war correspondent and covering some of the unrest around South Africa, Southern Africa and the continent generally, the fall of Mobutu, the Rwandan genocide, uh, the civil war in Angola, <coughs> especially what you would call the second civil war, which started again in 1993 when Savimbi wouldn't accept the elections, there was a lot to write about. So yeah. children's books took a bit of a backseat at mm -hmm. that point. I wrote two non-fiction books initially. One of them was published in 1995. Um, it was called True North, African Roads Less Travelled. And that the idea about that was I was a young guy, 29. I'd come back to South Africa after living in New York. And I decided to travel as much as I could outside of the South African borders to see what it was like that Africa now was opening up to us. We'd been the pariah state for so many years. So that was the idea of True North. Um, and in the end, the last chapter is a long chapter on the Rwandan genocide, which was a profound and powerful experience. I was part of the BBC documentary team that mm -hmm. uh, went and did that. So you're part of that team. Um, how, how, what's, what was the experience like um, for you being there and seeing all of that? Well, it was, as a Marine officer once said to me about going to war in Helmand province, it was a physical, emotional and spiritual odyssey. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've never completely guess, gotten over some of the things I saw. We went to a churchyard called Nyarabuya where there must have been 4,000 bodies. Quite badly decomposed by the time we got there. We got there in early May, the, or mid-May I should say. The Rwandan genocide started in late April. So the evidence was still very clear um, of what had happened. And remember also the people who were trapped in these churches and places fought back. So it didn't all just happen in a sort of explosion of rage. I mean, they were. Th it happened over a period of weeks, if, if not six, six weeks or so. So there was a lot of blood, a lot of corpses, mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of things mm -hmm. to see. I've written about it. I've written about it in numerous articles and things. And, and to me, that's been important, is bearing witness. I mean, Rwanda's in a very different place mm -hmm. today. It's amazing <coughs> how that country has changed. It really, really mm -hmm. is. And I think one really has to give, give a lot of credit where that's, where that's due. So. You know, we shouldn't get too stuck in the past either. You know, Rwanda has changed. I've been back to Rwanda doing business shows, actually. Mm -hmm. so, oh. so business is a big thing in Rwanda at the moment. It's yeah. a very big thing in Rwanda. I'm not an expert on it. Um, I last filmed there in 2014 when uh, President Obama had the first uh, African-US business summit, and I made some films for the f indirectly for the White House. Mm -hmm. So that was quite an, ex oh. quite an exciting experience. So how did the fiction writing come about? When did you decide to go into fiction and what is it that you like about writing fiction? Well, the first, I, I, I wrote Missy Mungu's words a long time ago when I lived in New York, a black friend and I got together and we wrote a book as if we had been pen pals when we were kids during the era of apartheid. And that, 
that is still selling a few copies as a set workbook in some of the schools in this country. So it's, it's, I'm quite proud of that. I'm oh, it was a set workbook for my son when he really? was. Really? Yes, oh, it was, wow, yeah. that's fantastic. Oh. Okay. Oh. Um, then I was in Mombasa on a shoot for the BBC, and we got chatting about this cannon that is in front of Fort Jesus that still stands there today. And it was about the First World War in East Africa, and one thing led to another, and the British cameraman said to me, you know, you do understand that the South Africans lost a nearby battle. They ran away. So I was like, well, you know, South Africans don't run away. You know what I mean? But I did the research, and it, it was correct. Um, three regiments of South African soldiers, they were all white soldiers, um, had been hastily put together for the First World War. It was the 5th, 6th, and 7th Transvaal regiments. Why they're not the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, I don't know. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> and they had officers from both the Boer side of the Boer War and NCOs and also from the British or English colonial side. So that was a unique kind of thing of these two ex-enemies uh, working together for a common goal. And I did a lot of research in Kenya and I wrote a book called The King's Shilling, which is one of my few books at the moment available on Kindle. And uh, it's basically about what happens to the missing because 133 miss men went missing and were never accounted for. Oh. Many of them were possibly eaten by hyenas, we just don't know. But some of them might have run away. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So, and, and uh, what is it that you like um, about writing fiction? What, how does it pr push you? I think you also teach classes in fiction writing? Yes, I do teach work mm -hmm. workshops in fiction and in narrative nonfiction because mm -hmm. they, they do overlap, you know. Uh, you can use fiction techniques narrative non-fiction. What I like about fiction is that it gives you the opportunity to explain deeper emotions, deeper thoughts. You don't have to stick to exactly what was said, recorded in your notebooks, recorded on a tape or a, a disc, you know, on the camera. So it gives, I mean, most of my fiction is, there's a lot of realistic historical research. I've written a book about a trip into, uh, to look for a lost city of Alexander the Great in Afghanistan called the House of War. And that was very much based on an experience I had where the, we were on a nor an, at a Northern Alliance outpost and the guy was banging on the rocks and he was going, Iskander, Iskander, uh -huh. which means Alexander. Yeah. And I didn't realize until I got back that this was actually a ruined city of Alexander the Great. Wow. And it was just before Google and all the wonderful things you can do on the internet. So I had to go into the Witz Science Library and I got the last copy, not the last copy, but the last article that had been written about archaeology in uh, Afghanistan since the Soviet invasion. And that gave me the basis on which to construct a journey of Claire and Sebastian. Claire's a filmmaker, Sebastian's an academic, and of course they fall in love and they meet all sorts of armed <coughs> fighters oh. and things like that. So there is a basis to reality. I think as a journalist mm -hmm. that's for me still quite intriguing and quite compelling. Mm -hmm. But you can start to look at what happened to Claire's psyche, you know, what happened to Sebastian when he was a child, growing up in what was then Rhodesia, mm -hmm. today obviously Zimbabwe, and what effect that had. It's called House of War. So it's quite symbolic. He grew up on a farmhouse in, in, in Zimbabwe during the kind of Bush War. And yet there's a temple of war in this ancient Greek city. So, you know, that's the kind of oh. thing you can play with with oh. fiction. So you're inspired by history, reality, archaeology? I am. Facts. And then I'm also inspired by my own imagination. Uh -huh. I, you know, we, if we look at my two Arabella books, uh -huh. Arabella the Moon and the Magic Mongongo Nut, and Arabella the Secret King and the Amulet from Timbuktu, I started writing the first one, Arabella the Moon, uh, because we were renovating our house. And the children had to sleep on sleeping bags in the living room floor. They had to eat meals from pick and pay and woolies out of, um, you know, the... Uh, microwaves. Mm. So I started writing a little story, they were quite little then, to sort of distract them. And then I began to see their reaction. And I realized that I was tapping into something that was quite symbolically real for them. Of course, Arabella gets a magic mongongo nut from the Kalahari, and she can turn into a butterfly. And it all happens in Park View, you see. So it oh. all happens around Tyrone Avenue. So it's deliberately set in a South African setting. Mm -hmm. It's a very kind of... Uh, non-racial group of kids who are friends who experience the world of magic but of course she also has problem because there's the evil hardy dars oh the evil hardy dars mm. who are led by their <laughs> king ozymandias 
And Ozymandias, of course, wants to steal the magic Mongongo nut. So that's the first adventure. Then the second one is she gets an amulet from a broom seller, also on Tyrone Avenue, who's a refugee from the war in Timbuktu in Mali. But just because he's poor and down and out and struggling doesn't mean that there aren't parts of his life where he's powerful and has magic. And so I think that's an important thing to point to make. And with this amulet, she can go to war against the evil Krokobek, who is a kind of African griffin uh -huh. who is wanting to take the world away from the world of magic and turn oh. it into his own. Sounds fantastic. Now tell me, why is it important <coughs> for children to grow up with books, with reading, with fantasy? Well, I'm a book lover, mm -hmm. so I think you know, you're speaking to the converted. I think it's really important for people's imagination, for kids' imagination. Remember, what I've found with these books is that they've really inspired children. I deliberately have set them in South Africa, Neisner, Johannesburg, play, um, there'll be other ones too, you know. And um, magic, in my opinion, is a powerful metaphor for personal transformation which we all do, even from the earliest ages, we're still doing it now in, in, in our middle age. So I think that's why magic speaks to us. You, you can't just wave a magic wand, like winning the lotto mm. in life. And I mean, people do win the lotto, of course, but by and large, most of us don't. We have to muddle through as best we can. We have to follow the rules of the world that we work in. So in Arabella, like in the Harry Potter series, there are very specific rules about when magic can be used and when it doesn't work. So Arabella has to make choices. She has to be brave. She sometimes becomes greedy. So then she has to recognize those faults within herself because without making those wise choices as a human being, the world of magic doesn't work for her. And she's only about 10 or 11. We never know quite mm -hmm. what age she exactly is. you know. But that's, I think, and I mean, the kids have responded to it just fantastically. I can't tell you how much traction the books are beginning to get. Or I've been reading at schools, selling 30, 40 books a time. So and the kids are enjoying it. The kids are enjoying it. I mean, I was at the Parkview Market selling it two years ago, and I had been reading at one of the schools, and a little girl who was about 11 came running up to me. She said, Hamilton, Hamilton. She gave <laughs> me a big hug. She said, because of you, I've started reading again. Uh -huh. Because of you and Arabella, I should oh, say. Fantastic. I've That's started reading again. Oh, that's, that's amazing. That's fantastic. Hamilton, thank you so much for coming in and chatting to us. Thank you, Jill. What a nice opportunity. Yeah. And so if you have kids, um, these are books, the Arabella series, that you can definitely look at um, showing to your kids and reading to them and uh, in, encourage them to read themselves. It's always great for them to, to build their minds and, and grow that way. And that was it for this edition of Talking Books. Thanks for joining us, and I'll see you again soon. <laughs>